Now, mistakes, 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 they happen, and that's fine. I mean, it's a simple fact of life. How we react to those mistakes can be a good indicator as to what type of person we are, or maybe what type of organization we are working with. If, for example, Trek culture were to say that Star Trek was awful and should be taken off the air immediately, then that would be a mistake. And if we were to continue saying that, then you would be at full right to start a galactic level war with us. But hey, we don't. We love Trek. But no one is immune to mistakes, least of all the many writers and producers on Trek. From the original series right up to Discovery, Picard and Lower Decks, very questionable decisions have managed to sneak their way through various editors and directors. This has resulted in things ending up on screen when really it would be simpler for them to have been, well, chucked in the bin. This list doesn't cover every mistake that's been made because, well, too many, innit? But it does cover quite a few of them. So let's do it. Once again, I'm Marcus Bronzy and here are 10 of the biggest behind the scenes Star Trek mistakes that have happened so far. Number 10. Warp Threshold Let there be no mistaking this. Threshold really is that bad. The idea for the episode came from the then head of New Line Cinema, Michael DeLuca. Brennan Braga wrote the episode with Robert Duncan McNeil being shocked by the first edit. He was stunned that they were actually going to film this. The idea behind the episode was to challenge a core rule that Gene Roddenberry had established. What would happen if we broke the Warp 10 barrier? What would it lead to? Braga hoped an interesting discussion on the nature of evolution would pursue, but... Instead, after Tom Paris succeeded in breaking the barrier, he and Janeway ended up evolving into some salamander-type creatures and did they sexy time? They sexy time, didn't they? Anyway, they turned into some salamander-type creatures, which was Braga's way of showing that evolution does not always travel upward. However, in the editing room, that explanation was lost. One bright spot on this dark and dreary tale is despite the nonsense that he had to take part in, Robert Duncan McNeil delivers a compelling performance as a man who is losing himself. Number 9. Changing Savick This is not a critique of Robin Curtis's portrayal of the Lieutenant Savick, but rather at the curious choice to retcon what was an essential element of her character between films. Though there were many drafts of the script for Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan, one of the earliest introduced Savick, originally named Wix, a male Vulcan, later lengthened to Savick. This half-Romulan, half-Vulcan female officer was shown to be more emotional than other Vulcan counterparts. There was a lot of uncertainty around the character, which was intriguing to say the least. Curse the Alley was very well received by audiences for her portrayal of Savick, but though she did not return for Star Trek 3 because of money issues, Robin Curtis took over the role and the half-Romulan aspect of the character was dropped, making Savick a full-blooded Vulcan. This totally flattened the character of Savick. The only true tender emotional sheen that she really got was the Pon Far scene with young Spock, and audiences were left scratching their heads as to why Savick, so emotional for a Vulcan in the previous film, was suddenly a colder, more 2D version of herself. Number 8. The Network Rejected the Cage while it is no secret that The Cage, the first pilot of Star Trek, was filmed in 1965 and starring Jeffrey Hunter, Leonard Nimoy and Majel Barrett was rejected by the network, this is actually a huge deal as it had massive ramifications for the franchise and the network. Whilst Captain Kirk and the gang cemented the show with the iconic status of their five-year mission, the rejection of the original pilot was at least in part a dreadful misstep on behalf of the producers. It meant the loss of number one, a female executive officer who was already a trailblazer in that first hour. While Star Trek would thankfully retain strong female role models, the loss of Majel Barrett as first officer was a blow. Plus, what if they cancelled this first pilot and they never made the second one? <sighs> Breathe. I don't even want to go there because, well, we wouldn't be here. At the time, no one could have predicted the popularity of Star Trek and what it would become. This rejection would have killed the idea on the spot. Thankfully, though, because of this mistake, a second pilot was commissioned and we were given the gift that is Star Trek as we know it. Number 7. Enterprise aka let's make a prequel sequence, let's keep hinting at time travel, and then let's go nowhere. The temporal cold war, as cool as it sounds, was an element of Enterprise that truly could have been gold. However, the story was hampered by the fact that it was meandering and often pointless. The Suliban, another one of those species that were kind of forgotten by Starfleet, well until Lower Decks that is, were an interesting addition to the franchise, but then they also turned into a bit of a damp squib. The Temporal Cold War was an addition to Star Trek at the request of the studio. Rarely, when the studio requests something, is that a good thing. 
Brennan Braga admits that it was a chance to be a good idea, developing a backstory to the fighting, yet also admits that within the constraints of the series, it was somewhat lost. In season 4, showrunner Manny Koto wrapped up the storyline in the first two episodes, Stormfront. That was because he didn't feel there was anything left to say about the plot, and actor John Billingsley concurred, adding that he felt that Paramount Studios had dictated this move and it didn't work. Overall, it was an idea that sounded really, really cool. Temporal Cold War. But the execution left a stain on the Enterprise's first few seasons. Number 6. Doctor, you were fired. Just for a little bit though. Introduce a teenage character to appeal to younger viewers and then fire his mum for a year. That is what's happened on The Next Generation when Will Wheaton was introduced at Encounter at Farpoint as a bridge for younger viewers to come on board with the whole Star Trek thing. He was Wesley Crusher, the son of Dr. Beverly Crusher, the Enterprise's chief medical officer and friend of El Capitan Picard. He was also a tad annoying. But producer Maurice Hurley was fine with Wesley. It was Dr. Crusher that was the problem. Even though she was the third most popular character in the show, Hurley hated her and her character to the point where he managed to convince Jean to let her go. The cast was stunned and McFadden believed she had been let go because she'd been vocally critical of several of the behind the scenes decisions. However, in an oddly lucky set of events, Diana Moldor was not as popular as the thinly rewritten Dr. Pulaski and Hurley left at the end of the show's second season. Her Early going out meant McFadden came right back. And thank goodness for that. Number 5. Repetition. Repeating what worked on Deep Space Nine ended up causing a lot of hurt on Star Trek Voyager. When the ratings had begun to slip on Deep Space Nine, the producers decided to introduce the character of Worf to the station's roster. This worked great because Worf was loved from TNG and it boosted the ratings, also allowed Michael Dorn to become a true part of a cracking ensemble, showing more depth to his character than ever before. Four, Worf worked perfectly within the show, thanks in equal parts to his great acting and also great writing. Over on Star Trek Voyager though, the third season faced a similar issue of slipping ratings and the decision to simply repeat what had worked on Deep Space Nine, which was introduce a new character, was reached. But Worf, well, he was light years away and no amount of wormholeage and time travel could have him in two places at once without screwing the whole franchise. Thus, Seven of Nine was created as a character and Jennifer Lean was dropped from the show. This was the beginning of the issues. Firstly, Lean had been greatly liked by the rest of the cast, so their backs were up when this happened. Then Jerry Ryan was slipped in as Seven of Nine. Whilst Ryan was a fantastic addition to the show on screen, there were deep divisions behind the scenes from this shake-up. Whilst the show would last another four seasons, it's only in relatively recent years that any sort of camaraderie seems to have been built up between the actors themselves. Number 4. Enterprise Credits I got fame. <laughs> All of these years later, and it's still hard to find a little faith with the heart. I mean, look, there's not a lot to say that hasn't been said already about this entry. Each Star Trek series has their own set of usually wonderful opening credits. The original series theme is iconic, and the Star Trek march that Jerry Goldsmith composed works wonderfully for the next generation. Dennis McCarthy's offering for Deep Space Nine was Emmy Award winning, while returning Jerry Goldsmith compose what is potentially one of the most beautiful of them all with the Voyager theme. Flash forward, and Jeff Russo's themes for both Discovery and Picard follow the traditional orchestral molds, whilst Lower Decks, well, it employs some of the same retro music that accompanied the original animated series. Then there's Enterprise, Faith of the Heart. Whilst enjoying something of a renaissance now, and well, personally, I like it, it was still a weird choice for a Trek show. There was a composition called Archer's Theme that would have been the easy correct choice for the opening credits, but instead they went with something a little bit different. And it was the first show to be cancelled since the 60s. It's a bit much to blame it on the theme, but coincidence? I think not. Number 3. Remaking Star Trek 2 The Wrath of Khan when they really did not have to. From the movie franchise, there are several of the films that stand out above the rest. Star Trek II Wrath of Khan is up there. So when the film was effectively remade in the form of Star Trek Into Darkness, it felt particularly sour to moviegoers. Not least because of the sheer amount of denying it was going to be what it ended up becoming. A poor remake. I mean, Benedict Cumberbatch is a compelling villain here, but it's blatantly obvious that he is Khan. And when it's later confirmed that he is, in fact, the genetically engineered tyrant, 
it's treated with such wonder that it's a surprise that the film doesn't stop mid-scene simply to just point a massive arrow saying Khan, 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 just to make sure you get the point. Star Trek Into Darkness feels like it's a film made by committee, dedicated only to hitting buzzwords and never really searching for a coherent script. Number 2. Almost every decision that was made about T'Pol's character in the first season of Enterprise. T'Pol was created to be the Spock to Archer's Kirk, though from the very beginning it was very clear that behind the scenes the writers didn't really know what they wanted her to be. At best, she was a body with a brain. By which I mean that for almost every intellectual point that they wrote to come out of her mouth, Jolene Blaylock was written into another decontamination sequence. The producers wanted another hit character like Seven of Nine, but early on they spent more time trying to put her in situations where she was shown off for her figure rather than her skills, a disservice to both Blaylock and the character of T'Pol herself. Number 1. Shaving the Klingons The first season of Star Trek Discovery was a mixed affair, as it is when you launch a new series. I mean, there were production issues, behind the scenes issues that caused delays, issues with shooting, issues with scripting, issues with personnel changes. Couple this with the initially bizarre decision to introduce Spock's half-sister in a move clearly designed to grab ratings, and the new show was a bit wobbly. Then, a production image seeped onto the internet. Demon-like creatures were sat around a lunch table taking a break from filming. They looked fierce. They looked terrifying. They looked like a new species. And then a dreadful rumor got out there. These were not new inventions for the series. These were, in fact, Klingons. The Klingons have evolved over the years. That's cool. In the original series, they were just white guys with a bit of a tan, fluffy eyebrows and goatees, basically. So a change of image wasn't the worst decision that producers made. But rather than a slight deviation from the wharf-like Klingon that we know and love that worked amazingly over all these years, these new guys were jacked up on steroids, protein and plasticine. Nothing like the honourable warriors already established in the franchise. The show's second season worked to redeem their image somewhat, but it's clear that the decision to redesign them so drastically came from a board meeting where not enough people had the power to say no. So there you go, 10 of the biggest behind the scenes Star Trek mistakes that ever happened. Of course, you're going to have your opinion. You're going to have ones that you're like, Marcus, why did you miss that for? That should have gone in there. Don't be shy, slap them in the comments, who knows? We could have a part two of this list as well, and of course, drop us a like and a subscribe while you're at it too. We're on Twitter, at Trek Culture. I'm also on social medias as well, at Marcus Bronzy, M-A-R-C-U-S-B-R-O-N-Z-Y. Until next time, stay blessed.